Hey friends, welcome to Plant Miss Day 12. I can't believe we have arrived at the last day of the 12 days of Plant Miss. This has been such a cool experience for me. I hope all of you have enjoyed getting a new video every single day for the 12 days leading up to Christmas. This has been a lot more work than I expected, but I've really enjoyed it and I've really enjoyed connecting with all of you way more often than usual. In today's video, I thought it would be cool to do a much closer to real time time lapse video of the third painting from my December setup, but for something a little more interesting rather than just talking about what I'm doing, I thought I would read you an excerpt from a classic Christmas tale. And of course, stick around till the end of the video because I'm going to talk you through how you can enter the giveaway. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know, of my own knowledge, what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined, myself, to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade, but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it, or the county's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral, and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point I started from. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood, or nothing wonderful can come of the story I am going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night in the easterly wind upon his own ramparts than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, say, St. Paul's churchyard, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head and on his eyebrows and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, nor wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose. No pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with gladsome looks, "'My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me?' No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and then would wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. 
But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the knowing ones called nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal, and he could hear the people in the court outside go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been light all day, and the candles were flaring in the windows of the neighborhood offices like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that nature lived hard by, and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk put on his white comforter, and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, he failed. "'A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you!' cried a cheerful voice." It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah, said Scrooge, humbug. He had so heated himself with rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in a glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas, a humbug, uncle, said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I am sure. I do, said Scrooge. "'Merry Christmas! What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough!' "'Come, then,' returned the nephew gaily. "'What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough!' Scrooge, having no better answer ready on the spur of the moment, said, "'Bah!' again, and followed it up with, "'Humbug!' "'Don't be cross, uncle,' said the nephew." "'What else can I be?' returned the uncle. "'When I live in such a world of fools as this, "'Merry Christmas! "'Out upon Merry Christmas! "'What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money, "'a time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer, "'a time for balancing your books "'and having every item in them through a round dozen of months "'presented dead against you? "'If I could work my will,' said Scrooge indignantly, Every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle, sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew. But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you. Much good it has ever done you. "'There are many things from which I might have derived good, "'by which I have not profited, I dare say,' returned the nephew. "'Christmas among the rest. "'But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time "'when it has come around, apart from the veneration due to its sacred name and origin, "'if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time, "'a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, "'the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year "'when men and women seem by one consent "'to open their shut-up hearts freely, "'and to think of people below them "'as if they were really fellow passengers to the grave, "'and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. "'And therefore, uncle, "'though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, "'I believe that it has done me good, "'and will do me good, "'and I say, God bless it.' The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Becoming immediately sensible of the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished the last frail spark forever. "'Let me hear another sound from you,' said Scrooge, "'and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. "'You're quite a powerful speaker, sir,' he added, turning to his nephew. "'I wonder you don't go into Parliament.' "'Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow.' Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did.' 
He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. "'But why?' cried Scrooge's nephew. "'Why?' "'Why did you get married?' said Scrooge. "'Because I fell in love.' "'Because you fell in love,' growled Scrooge, as if that were the only thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. "'Good afternoon.' "'Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now?' "'Good afternoon,' said Scrooge. "'I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends?' "'Good afternoon,' said Scrooge. "'I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party, but I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So a Merry Christmas, uncle.' "'Good afternoon,' said Scrooge. "'And a Happy New Year.' "'Good afternoon,' said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word notwithstanding. He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. "'There's another fellow,' muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. "'My clerk, with fifteen shillings a week, and a wife and family, talking about a merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam.' This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. "'Scrooge and Marley's, I believe,' said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. "'Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley?' "'Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years,' Scrooge replied. "'He died seven years ago, this very night.' "'We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner,' said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word, liberality, Scrooge frowned, and shook his head, and handed the credentials back. "'At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge,' said the gentleman, taking up a pen, "'it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provisions for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time.' "'Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. "'Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir.' "'Are there no prisons?' asked Scrooge. "'Plenty of prisons,' said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. "'And the union workhouses?' demanded Scrooge. "'Are they still in operation?' "'They are still,' returned the gentleman. "'I wish I could say they were not.' "'The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then?' said Scrooge. "'Both very busy, sir.' "'Oh, I was afraid, from what you said at first, "'that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course,' said Scrooge. "'I'm very glad to hear it. "'Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body in the multitude,' returned the gentleman, "'a few of us were endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. "'We chose this time because it is a time of all others, "'when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. "'What shall I put you down for?' Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you asked me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It's not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labours with an improved opinion of himself, and in a more facetious temper than was usual with him. Meanwhile the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible, and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street, at the corner of the court, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes, and had lighted a great fire in a brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered— 
warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing sullenly congealed and turned to misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Poulterers and grocers' trades became a splendid joke, a glorious pageant, with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and the baby sallied out to buy the beef. Foggier yet, and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good St. Dustin had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol, but at the first sound of... God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. Scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to the fog and even more congenial frost. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every twenty-fifth of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his greatcoat to the chin. "'but I suppose you must have the whole day. "'Be here all the earlier next morning.'" And that is it for today's little excerpt of A Christmas Carol. I hope you enjoyed it. I wish I could read you the whole story, but we don't have time for that. So without further ado, let's talk about the giveaway details for the 12 days of Plantmas. So as you remember from the explanation video before all of this started, you'll need to watch every video of Plantmas to get every secret word, which you will put together to make a phrase. This phrase is your secret key, your password to be able to accept your prize if you are selected to win. Please do not write the secret phrase in the comments of this video. I will delete that comment. That is not how you enter the giveaway. If you would like to enter the giveaway, all you have to do is be subscribed to my YouTube channel, like this video, and write a comment down below telling me your favorite of the Plant Miss videos and one video you would like to see me do in 2020. That's it. Be subscribed, like this video, and leave a comment with your favorite Plant Miss video and a video you'd like to see in 2020, and you are entered to win the giveaway. I'll give everyone a few days to enter. So on Saturday, the 28th of December, I'll go through the comments and use a random comment selector to select 12 winners. If I reach out to you, letting you know that you are a potential winner, I will need you to tell me the special phrase. This is when you need those special words from all of the videos, that plant miss phrase. And if you have the phrase, you are a winner. When you win, I will ask you which of the giveaway items you most want to win, and I will do my best once I have the 12 winners to assign prizes to the people who want them most. I can't guarantee that you'll get your first choice, but I will do my very best. The 12 prizes are six notebooks, which are the stone paper notebook, the Suki bullet journal, Amanda Rach Lee's doodle planner, the unbound planner, and two Suki soft cover notebooks. And the other six prizes are the full core collection that I launched in my shop. So the mini calendar set, the timeline set, and the number set, you can select if you'd prefer the Monday or Sunday version of the calendar set if you win one of those prizes. 
If you're worried that you won't necessarily see it if I comment back to you to let you know you won your prize on YouTube, you can also leave in your comment another way for me to contact you. So maybe your Instagram handle so I can send you a DM or your Twitter handle so I could send you a message on there, whatever's easiest. If you don't leave any way to contact you, I'll just comment back to you on YouTube. And if I don't hear back from you within a reasonable amount of time, I will have to select a new winner. So hopefully that makes sense. This giveaway is open internationally. So no matter where you live, you can enter. If you're under 18, please ask a parent or guardian's permission to enter the giveaway. And that's it. Good luck. Thank you for hanging out with me for all of Plantmas. I've had such an amazing time and maybe, just maybe, I'll do this again next year. Thank you to my patrons for their support as always. Y'all are incredible and I really appreciate you. And I will see all of you very soon in my next video on Saturday for my husband's January setup. Bye friends.